Tonight at 10, Boris Johnson is to meet the French president this weekend to try to defuse the growing row over post-Brexit fishing rights. France is threatening to block British vessels accessing her ports in retaliation for what it says are too few licenses for French boats to use British waters. Boris Johnson says he's puzzled but will do what he has to to protect British interests as the Prime Minister and the French President both arrive here in Rome tonight. Other leaders, including President Biden, who met the Pope, are hoping for progress on climate talks before next week's UN conference in Glasgow. We'll have the very latest live from Rome, also tonight. The wife found guilty of murdering her husband, whom she'd claimed abused her for years. She told police she did it. I admit it all. All right. Just get them. All right. I want to go in. All right. No, so... he's on the kitchen. Yeah. Islamic State group bomb attacks put the Taliban under pressure in Afghanistan. We have a special report. And celebrating the cultural enrichment of Britain through immigration to mark 150 years of the Royal Albert Hall. And coming up in the sport on the BBC News Channel, Pakistan are on the brink of the semi-finals of the Men's T20 World Cup after a thrilling win over Afghanistan. Good evening. Boris Johnson is to meet the French President Emmanuel Macron this weekend to try to defuse growing tensions over post-Brexit fishing rights. Both leaders are in Rome attending a G20 summit amid acrimony between the UK and France concerning access to each other's territorial waters. France claims Britain has denied fishing licences to dozens of French boats, while Britain says the majority of licences licenses have been issued, but some French vessels don't meet the criteria for British waters. France, having already impounded one UK vessel, is now threatening to block other boats entering her ports. Boris Johnson says he's puzzled by the threat and warns he'll do whatever's necessary to protect UK interests. With the very latest, here's our political correspondent, Alex Forsyth. Arriving in Rome with a diplomatic row brewing, the Prime Minister stressed the ties that bind the UK and France. An old ally and friend, but the French president tonight told the Financial Times the UK's credibility is at stake in the row over fishing. This is the front line of this fight, which has been rumbling for months. The authorities here in Jersey and across the UK say they have stuck to agreements made after Brexit and issued licenses to French boats that can prove a history of fishing these waters. But France says dozens have been unfairly denied. Local fishermen, like their counterparts across the channel, are frustrated and worried. The feeling amongst the fleet yesterday was one of absolute despair. Certainly there are real difficult times ahead uh, and our big worry down here is how are we going to try and preserve the fleet and come out the other end with the fishing fleet intact. The row escalated this week when this British trawler was detained by French authorities, a warning shot about what might follow. France has threatened further checks and restrictions on British vessels, even suggested it could disrupt cross-channel trade. The Prime Minister said he'd be surprised if that happened, but the UK was ready to do what's necessary. The government is ready to retaliate. Two can play at that game, is what I would say, but in the first instance, uh, what, what we're doing is raising this with the European Commission. It's, it's always open to us to uh, increase the um, uh, enforcement that we do on uh, French vessels, to board more of them, if that's what they're doing uh, to our vessels. In a further sign of tension, the French ambassador was summoned to the Foreign Office, where she was given a dressing down. The language on both sides is ramping up, but they are still talking. Both here and in France, fishing is an emotional issue which carries political clout. Boris Johnson promised British fishermen Brexit would mean a better deal. In France, President Macron's facing an election which brings its own pressures. Both sides have reasons to take a tough stance, but both know a serious escalation could be damaging. This spring, French boats staged a protest off Jersey over the same issue. 
The UK says it does want a diplomatic solution to this ongoing dispute. France has set a deadline of Tuesday for it to be resolved. There is a time for a flexi muscles and, 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 and put your, your, you know, your trump cards on the table. And there are times for negotiations. The next step is really negotiation. But for now, it's the fishermen that are caught in this diplomatic row. Alex Forsyth, BBC News, Westminster. Well, as we've heard, the French Prime Minister and uh, Boris Johnson and other world leaders are in Rome with the US President Joe Biden meeting the Pope at the Vatican ahead of a G20 summit. Earlier, Pope Francis had urged governments to come up with effective responses to deal with carbon emissions as the United Nations COP26 climate summit gets underway in Glasgow next week. Our North America editor John Sopel is travelling with the US President and sent us this report. The ruler of the world's preeminent superpower en route to meet the world's most powerful religious leader. But for Joe Biden, only America's second Roman Catholic president, this is an audience with his spiritual guide and clearly someone he admires enormously. You are the most significant warrior for peace I've ever met. And with your permission, I'd like to be able to give you a coin. I know my son would want me to give this to you. The president gave him a coin as a gift and then joked about his Irish heritage. I'm the only Irishman you've ever met who's never had a drink. <laughs> and the Pope chose the BBC today, in particular thought for the day on Radio 4, to deliver a firm message to the political elite ahead of next week's crucial COP26 summit. The political decision makers who will meet at COP26 in Glasgow are urgently summoned to provide effective responses to the present ecological crisis and in this way to offer concrete hope to future generations. Joe Biden agrees with the Pope about the urgency, but will words be matched by actions? The motorcades will be sweeping through Rome this weekend, through Glasgow next week world leaders tasked with saving the planet. So no big deal then. Around the world there have been protests of varying size to chivy world leaders into action. This was the scene in Tel Aviv today. In Glasgow outside where the summit will be held next week, the demonstrators seem to be outnumbered by security guards. And in London, Greta Thunberg was the star attraction. She's buried somewhere in this mob of photographers. And she had this message for President Biden. When you are a leader of, of the most powerful country in the world, then you have lots of responsibility. And when the US is actually, in fact, in, like, expanding fossil fuel infrastructure, that is a clear sign that they are not really treating the climate crisis as an emergency. And this salvo to other nations from the former California governor and Terminator star. All of those countries that come and give speeches that we're not going to go and lose jobs because of this going green and all that, they're liars. They, or they're just stupid and they don't know how to do it. Joe Biden on this trip to Europe wants to show that America is leading the world on tackling climate change. But his 85 vehicle convoy, most of which were flown in from the US, may not be leading by example. Or in this holy city, practicing what you preach. John Sopel, BBC News, Rome. Well, our political editor, Laura Koonsberg, is in Rome for us tonight. Laura, on fishing, is there any confidence both sides may be able to see eye to eye on this when Boris Johnson and Emmanuel Macron meet on Sunday? Clive, not at this stage. I mean, Downing Street doesn't want this to plunge into a massive political punch-up, especially not when there's so much to be else to be talking about. And Boris Johnson earlier tried to play down the chances of this descending into some very serious standoff over trade. But at the same time, it's not something that they can ignore. The government took its own actions today by summoning the French ambassador, being told in for a telling off at the Foreign Office. And it all makes for a rather bumpy conversation between the president and the prime minister here on Sunday. But the main business in Rome for the G20 leaders will centre, of course, on climate before COP26 in Glasgow next week. 
Well, that's right, Clive. And do not underestimate how much political pressure there is on Boris Johnson, having made this a priority for his government, literally playing host to the world. By the time all of the huge big show on the road here moves to Scotland at the end of this weekend, there is, of course, a formidable alliance, whether that's the Pope, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Joe Biden, Boris Johnson or other Western leaders who want to help the Brits in their task of pushing the world further and faster on their commitments to help halt changes to the climate. But there are also formidable powers on the other side who aren't as enthusiastic, who aren't as reluctant, whether that's China or India. It's certainly not a slam dunk for Downing Street. They know that these big climate talks coming are vitally important. And they're at this stage not at all confident that they're going to be able to pull off what they want to achieve. OK, Laura, thank you. Laura Koonsberg there live in Rome. A woman has been found guilty of murder after stabbing her husband to death following a row over a birthday meal. Penelope Jackson, who's 66, attacked her husband David with a kitchen knife at their home in Somerset in February. Mrs Jackson claimed he was violent and controlling, but the judge at Bristol Crown Court said he had no doubt that her husband was nothing like the person she'd claimed and sentenced her to life in prison. Here's Andrew Plant. February this year and police arrive at a bungalow on the Somerset coast. Hey, madam, do you need to step outside for me a minute? Can you, can you come outside? Yes, thank you. Penny Jackson opens the door, filmed on police body cam. Inside, her 78-year-old husband is dying. The retired Lieutenant Colonel has called police to say she stabbed him. I admit it all. All right. Just get them. All right, all right. I want to go in, all right? No, so, he's on the kitchen yeah. floor. Paramedics arrive. If there's any luck, you'll be too late. Oh, I should have stabbed him a bit more. He's an aggressive bully and nasty, and I've had enough. And when he said, you wouldn't do it, I did it twice more. I am okay, are you with the As she waited for the police, she told 999 she'd stabbed her husband with a kitchen knife. I thought I'd get his heart, well, he hasn't got one, and then twice in the abdomen. While she waited, Penny Jackson wrote this note entitled Confession. She said, I have taken so much abuse over the years, adding, may he rot in hell. The retired accountant claimed she'd been subjected to control, coercion and violence throughout their marriage. The court heard David Jackson had been aggressive to his wife on three occasions 20 years ago. But the judge said it was Penny Jackson who'd been the controlling one in their marriage. He said he had no doubt that she had intended to kill her husband and he added she had shown not one shred of remorse for what she'd done throughout this whole trial. There's only been one voice in this trial, and that's of Penelope Jackson. David Jackson hasn't been able to respond to the allegations put to him around the history of domestic abuse, and that was a really difficult issue for the jury to, to make a judgment on. Further arresting you for murder. Oh, um, good. I've already cautioned you. David and Penny's daughter Isabel said she'd had two fantastic parents, but from the moment an officer knocked on her door, she knew she'd lost not just her dad, but her mum too. Penny Jackson was sentenced to life in prison. She'll serve a minimum of 18 years. Andrew Plant, BBC News, Bristol Crown Court. Buckingham Palace says the Queen's doctors have advised her to continue to rest for at least the next fortnight. Our royal correspondent Johnny Diamond is here. What more is the palace saying? Well, remember, this is the third such announcement now in 10 days. First of all, there was Northern Ireland, then there was Glasgow. Now there's this fortnight of no official visits, just light desk duties is what the palace calls it. And there will be some who are worried about that. The message, the word I get from the palace is, again, no real cause for concern. And remember, Clive, the Queen carried out three virtual engagements in the last three days. And she was seen smiling and beaming through a couple of them. She was clearly having a good time. Most notable about the palace's statement is that it says it is the Queen's firm intention to take part in Remembrance Sunday in central London on November the 14th. 
that day, that day of remembrance, is absolutely critical to the Queen, the most important day in her calendar. It's also quite a hard day. She has to stand for quite a long time. It's quite often a cold day. She is 95. So I think what this is is about a fortnight where she can gather her strength. She has become tired. She can gather her strength and make sure she meets her solemn commitment. Sure. OK, Johnny, many thanks. Johnny Diamond. The UK recorded higher levels of COVID infection in the week to last Friday than at any time since last winter. The Office for National Statistics estimates 1.3 million people would have tested positive for the virus. Here's our health editor, Hugh Pym. Booster jabs like these being delivered in Leeds today are seen by ministers as vital in the drive to keep ahead of the virus. They're offered six months after a second dose, but from today the NHS has been told there can be flexibility on timing. For example, if uh, someone, a doctor, is visiting a care home and uh, there might be one or two residents that are just short of the six-month point, they can use their discretion and, and make sure everyone is boosted in the same session. Daily reported cases may not be rising, but part of the explanation may be fewer school pupils coming forward for tests during half-term holidays. The Office for National Statistics does regular household testing, which picks up the underlying trend. The latest ONS survey suggests that last week 1.3 million people in the UK had the virus, higher than the peak in January. In England, one in 50 people had the virus. In Wales, it was one in 40. And in both Scotland and Northern Ireland, one in 75 people. There were increases in all the UK's nations. So what might the ONS data tell us about this week when it's published? I wouldn't be surprised uh, to see uh, a reduction in our data um, in the next week or so. However, what we saw this time last year was that little half-term reduction followed by uh, a significant increase. So uh, I really am not uh, being complacent there. Case rates may be higher, but hospital admissions are about a quarter the level seen in January, thanks to protection offered by vaccines. Wales has the highest infection rate in the UK and new measures are being brought in to tackle the virus. Covid passes are being extended to cinemas, theatres and concert halls from mid-November and other venues may yet be included. The First Minister said this was necessary to allow a normal Christmas and the pandemic was far from over. Hugh Pym, BBC News. The government's latest coronavirus figures for the UK show there were nearly 43,500 new infections recorded in the latest 24-hour period. That's nearly 6,000 fewer cases than last Friday. It means an average of just over 41,000 new cases were reported per day in the last week. The number of people in hospital with COVID was close to 9,000 as of yesterday. There were 186 deaths, that's of people who died within 28 days of a positive test, which takes the average number of deaths over the past seven days to 152. The total number of people who've died with COVID now stands at just over 140,000. On vaccinations, 86.7% of people aged 12 and over have uh, had their first jab and, moving on, nearly 80% have been double jabbed. And 7.2 million people have received their booster jab. This includes third doses for those with certain health conditions. Now, having retaken control of Afghanistan, the Taliban now faces an internal threat from Islamic State group fighters who claim the Taliban isn't hardline enough. Although IS don't control any territory, the worsening security situation is a concern for world leaders. The Taliban insists it has the situation under control and is playing down the threat of IS. But in the city of Jalalabad in eastern Afghanistan, Taliban fa forces face daily targeted attacks, as Sikunda Kamani explains. A new chapter is beginning in this conflict. We've come to its front line. The Taliban now rule the country. But here in Jalalabad, they're facing an almost daily stream of targeted attacks by the local branch of the Islamic State group. This, a roadside bombing. The hit-and-run tactics of the Taliban now used against them. It's not just the Taliban who are under attack. Abdul Rahman Marwin was a prominent social activist. His two young sons saw him gunned down earlier this month. 
When the Taliban took power, we were hopeful that all the violence and killing would finally stop. But now we face this new phenomenon with the name of IS. The Taliban's intelligence service has detained dozens of alleged IS members. Hundreds escaped from prison during the group's takeover. Dead bodies with notes labelling them IS fighters are dumped by the road every few days. But the Taliban won't admit responsibility for the extrajudicial killings. They accuse IS of being extremists. IS accuse the Taliban of not being radical enough. There are almost daily attacks in Jalalabad, it seems. Are you really in control of the situation here? Just as we defeated international forces on the battlefield with the blessing of Allah, we tell the world not to worry about any small group of traitors carrying out attacks here. They will be defeated too. IS has been launching attacks for years, but they've spread to new parts of the country since the Taliban came to power. This, a twin suicide bombing on a Shia mosque in the Taliban stronghold of Kandahar. The group don't control any territory, but they have deadly cells, particularly here in Jalalabad. IS is much less powerful than the Taliban, but the attacks they're carrying out here are causing real concern, both for Afghans exhausted by bloodshed and internationally. American officials warn IS could launch foreign operations in as little as six months' time. This former member says the group has global ambitions but lacks capacity. They issued threats to the whole world. They wanted to establish their rule everywhere. But those are just words. They are not powerful enough to take over Afghanistan. The Taliban have increased security around eastern Afghanistan. Publicly, they're playing down the threat from IS, but many fear more violence lies ahead. Sekanda Kamani, BBC News, Jalalabad. Women campaigning for free hormone replacement therapy on the NHS in England have won a partial victory to help all women experiencing the menopause. The government is to now only charge for the cost of one prescription of HRT a year. However, in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, the treatment is free. Campaigners have been protesting outside Parliament today, as our political correspondent Helen Catt reports. They're menopausal and they came to Parliament Square to shout about what that means. Among them, some famous faces who've made breaking taboos around the menopause a personal mission. I'm trying to help one woman at a time, but in there we just saw the start of something where it feels like all women will get helped and it wasn't political it was like it was the beginning of a female revolution you know i'm postmenopausal so for many women the symptoms that come with menopause can be a shock affected the way i was thinking and feeling yeah from confidence to mood swings to brain fog adele now combines running this pub in kent with helping other women through a life stage that she found challenging i felt like i just completely lost myself and at the time, I just didn't know what it was. Sorry. No? What do you mean? It was menopause. And this is why I do what I do. Because I just didn't want another woman to look in the mirror and lose themselves like I did. Adele says hormone replacement therapy helped her. It's free on the NHS in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, but has to be paid for in England. Adele's patches cost £9.35 a time on the NHS, but other women can face a double charge if their treatment contains two hormones. Carolyn Harris. In the House of Commons, a Labour MP who's been a leading campaigner on menopause pushed for change. There's no avoiding the menopause for half of the population. Most women will spend at least a third of their lives either pre-menopausal, post-menopausal or the joy menopausal. We must ensure that for those women who need it, they are not denied HRT because of financial restraints. Yeah, yeah. The minister agreed. She said she would look at the charging policy for treatments which contain two hormones. She also said doctors will be able to prescribe a year's worth of HRT for the cost a woman would usually pay for one batch. I can tell the House that we will amend the regulations to reduce the costs and improve access to HRT. 
So instead of paying for a repeat prescription every month or every three months, the prescriber can issue a batch of prescriptions for up to 12 months with one signature and one prescription charge. So HRT won't be free in England, but it will cost less. Another step in what seems to be a growing move to make real changes for women at a crucial stage of their lives. Helen Catt, BBC News, Westminster. To mark the 150th anniversary of the Royal Albert Hall, a new festival has opened tonight to celebrate the contribution of immigration to British life and culture. A concert by the musician Nitin Sawney begins a week of events at the Hall showcasing the immigrant experience. Nitin has been speaking to our entertainment correspondent, Colin Patterson. Nitin Sawney performing Journeys, his new work highlighting the contribution immigrants have made to the UK. The opening concert of a festival he has curated. The idea was to counteract any kind of negative ideas of immigrants and who they are. I really think people who came over to this country from the Caribbean or from Africa or from India, you know, um, or Pakistan, a lot of them have got very strong, amazing and inspiring journeys that I wanted to reflect in the music. Nitin Sawney's parents emigrated from India in the 1960s. He was born and grew up in Kent, and he is worried about what he believes is a tougher stance on immigrants and refugees today. I've seen attitudes change in the course of my lifetime. You know, when I was young, there was the National Front, um, who actually were very, you know, very, very anti-immigrant. There was a time during the 2012 Olympics where we were really embracing multiculturalism. You know, things have shifted again, I think, and, and there's been a lot of anti-immigrant sentiment. Do you understand, though, why people have concerns when they, they see the daily crossings from Calais and there's people who are losing their own jobs and struggling? No, I don't see it. I, I, I get frustrated when I see it. I think it's based on bigotry and prejudice. Preethan Narayanan is an American of South Indian heritage who's been living in the UK for the last decade. Being a female Hindu Indian violinist, to be able to come and be at a very important English institution that's historical, that's classical, that kind of dichotomy and that interaction is really special. Born in right or wrong location, Sanjeev Bhaskar read one of Nitin Sawney's poems. Back in the 1990s, they developed the sketch show, Goodness Gracious Me. Bombay is the restaurant capital of India. So how come every Friday night we end up here, eh? Because that's what you do, eh? You go out, you get tanked up on lussies and you go for an English. <laughs> when we started, we didn't see people like us that were in a position to have a public platform which you could curate a week like this. We just didn't see those kind of people around. And I think we're very much now part of, uh, you know, the, the fabric of society, whether people like that or not. And while this is only the start of the Journeys Festival, Nitin Sonny hopes that its impact will continue to travel. Colin Patterson, BBC News. That's it. Now on BBC One, time for the news where you are. Have a very good night. Hello, you're watching BBC News. I'm Sean Lay with the latest headlines. Pope Francis has called on world leaders to take radical decisions at the forthcoming Climate Change Summit, which opens in Glasgow this weekend. In a special message filmed by the BBC, he called for a meaningful deal to give hope to future generations. President Joe Biden, who's the, only the second Catholic president in US history, met the Pope at the Vatican Friday. He's in Rome for the G20 summit before heading to Glasgow for COP26. President Biden has also met French President Emmanuel Macron. Mr Biden said that the US had been clumsy in the way it struck a submarine deal with Australia in the process scrapping France's own agreement with the Australians. Lawmakers in Poland have approved plans to build a wall along much of its border with Belarus following a surge in the number of migrants trying to enter the EU. Those are the headlines.
Hello and welcome to Look Air to what the papers will be bringing us on Saturday morning. Joining me tonight, the author and journalist Yasmin Alibaya Brown and Martin Lipton, chief sports reporter with The Sun. Welcome to you both. Let me bring you at home up to date with some of the front pages that they've been looking at over the last few minutes. The Queen has been told to rest for two weeks. That makes the front page of papers, including the Daily Mail. The palace is quoted as saying the 95-year-old monarch could undertake some light duties during this time, but she will miss the Festival of Remembrance on Saturday. Day, November the 13th. Telegraph leads on Britain's post-Brexit fishing round with France. Show Britain that Brexit is damaging is the headline starts from France's Prime Minister in a letter written to the President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen. You can't avoid the COP26 summit in Glasgow in the papers. The Times, though, is reporting bad news for Boris Johnson's attempts to get a deal. China appears to have rebuffed the Prime Minister's plea to do more. Instead, it's holding out with India. On that, and the weekend edition of The Eye has an interview with Mr. Bo Mr Johnson on climate change. He told the paper it would be incredibly difficult to get a result. There's been progress and there are big commitments, however. As the clock ticks down towards the opening of the summit, the paper has a quote from Mr Johnson which says the beginning of the end of the climate crisis. That's the front page of The Guardian. So let's begin. Yasmin, can I begin with you, uh, if I may? And the front of the FT on the Saturday morning, Macron says British credibility is on trial. This, this is really interesting because, um, as we know, the FT is not a sensationalist paper. And what Macron is doing here is really, I think, quite interesting. He's linking the Northern Ireland Protocol um, continuing endless wrangling over that to this fishing dispute that's just erupted. And I think what he's doing here um, is, and with some justification, saying Britain cannot be trusted. They sign deals, uh, people sign deals with them in good faith, and then, uh, you know, the UK behaves the way it's, it's doing. And so this, you know, seizing of the trawler that happened yesterday um, is now being linked to something broader in terms of the deal that was done over Brexit and how there's, it's still continuing, the disputations mm. are still continuing. So that is quite interesting, I think. Martin, I, I suppose the, the advantage to that is it makes it look less like a kind of nationalist squabble by the British and the French in particular. So from Macron's point of view, you can say, look, I'm being virtuous here. I'm not thinking about the election next summer. Gracious no, me, no. Thinking I'm thinking about, the, about, I'm thinking summer, about sure. the, the bigger <laughs> point, the bigger principle. And, and in a sense, as Yasmin says, he's got some justification, hasn't he? Look, this is all about electioneering for Macron. Of course it is. This is. What do you want to do if you're a French prime minister or French president? You know what de Gaulle did? You talk about perfidious Albion and try and turn the British into some sort of you know, bogeyman in the short term because it, it benefits you electorally. That's exactly what he's doing. It's no surprise. He's fearful. He's been down in the polls in France. He doesn't know who his challenger is going to be. It looks like Barnier now. Uh, who may end up outflanking him from the right. Who knows what's going to happen? He's in trouble. He wants to bolster himself uh, against a potential election defeat, which would be humiliating. Um, the problem is that he has got the right, I think, to question uh, the UK's uh, ability to hold up to agreements it legally undertook just a few short months ago. And therein he can talk about credibility on trial. Uh, he's using a pretext to justify his own uh, domestic crisis, which is a political crisis. Yasmin? I don't think it's... A, I, I think it's not helpful to constantly do what, um, you know, is often done, especially by the right in this country, you know, always picking fights, always picking wars. Look, there were things we said we agreed to, and Boris Johnson's government has reneged, has slipped, has become slippery on this, slippery on that. So, in a way, I do agree that this is partly Macron uh, playing to his own electorate, but also the interview in the FT is a serious interview about can the UK be trusted? And it is a very important political question. Um, we need to be seen as tr trustworthy. Um, especially with challenges coming now. So, yes, part of it, a part of it is electioneering, but what he's saying can't be dismissed in this kind of, you know, we're at war with France, France again. I don't think it's, it's wise. Martin, there's a, quite an interesting article on the front of the Telegraph 
which quotes from a, a letter the French Prime Minister has written to, this is uh, Jean Cassix, has written to um, uh, the President of the European Commission, basically asking them to enforce the, the rules on